This is CBC Nova Scotia News. Tonight, just in time, a final rush of Ukrainians arrive in Nova Scotia ahead of the emergency visa deadline. Bubble bursts. Some beer taps are running dry after the province's craft brewery boom. And curling gold. Team Canada triumphs at the World Women's Championships in Sydney. Building clouds tonight with periods of rain streaming in from the south as we work throughout the day on Tuesday. Your full forecast is coming up. Good evening. With a deadline looming for Ukrainians to come to Canada, Nova Scotia is seeing a spike in new arrivals. Ottawa created an emergency visa program for Ukrainians after Russia's full-scale invasion in 2022. That program is coming to a close at the end of this month. As Taryn Grant reports, some families have scrambled to settle in Canada before the opportunity is gone. Irina Lichna said goodbye to her life in Kiev when the war broke out. And she's been trying to find a new home for herself and her two boys ever since. They lived in Turkey for two years, but it wasn't a good fit. So at the start of this year, they went back to Ukraine. The city where we will, where we will stay, like my mom place, my mom home, it was far from the war line. Uh, but still there, uh, like everyday Syrian rockets, like not save the place. There is no safe place in Ukraine. Earlier this month, she packed a few bags and flew to Halifax. It was actually a big risk for me because I feel myself like energetically. I I was feel like I'm staying on the on the top of mountains with two kids, and I'm jumping, and I'm jumping. I don't know where. Under Ottawa's emergency visa, Lichna gets two weeks in a hotel for free. She's one of more than 4,000 people who have come to Nova Scotia under that program, and this is one of the first stops for many of them. From a church basement in Dartmouth. The Ukraine store offers free furniture and other household items to Ukrainian newcomers. Rick Langell started the charity two years ago. The last couple of weeks, we've seen uh, larger numbers come out of uncertainty of what's going to happen in Ukraine um, because they can always go back, I guess, if things get better. But after March 31st, it would be difficult for them to come. So they're coming with a sense of urgency uh, to, to make a better place for their families. Langell says the Ukraine store has become more than just a donation centre. It's also a place to socialize, because many Ukrainians have come to Canada without knowing anyone here. This political science professor, who is herself a Ukrainian immigrant, says that's why Ukrainians fleeing the war need the resources that come with Canada's emergency visa. Lots of people have no connection to Canada. So that period of having an accommodation and knowing you have a place to put your head on for the night and then you can prepare your documents or your, uh, everything that is needed upon arrival was very important. Ukrainians can still come to Canada after March 31st, but they'll have to go through other immigration pathways. They won't have access to two free weeks accommodation or an open work permit. For people like Irina Lichna, those things are proving invaluable. It's like second chance for us. The war in Ukraine may be far from over, but Lichna says she's ready to turn the page and start a new life here for her and her boys. Um, Taryn Grant, CBC News, Halifax. A Nova Scotia judge has signed off on a plan to allow for the restructuring of the Saltwire group of newspapers, which includes the Halifax Chronicle Herald and the Cape Breton Post. Saltwire has been declared insolvent, and today's ruling by a Nova Scotia Supreme Court justice confirms that the company will be under bankruptcy protection until May 3rd. That's to give advisors time to help the company restructure and try and find buyers to take it over. The search for buyers has been underway since last fall and so far has not yielded any results. The RCMP say they will provide a progress report this week on how they are responding to recommendations from the inquiry into the 2020 Nova Scotia mass shooting. The report will be delivered by Commissioner Mike Duhem and uh, Assistant Commissioner Dennis Daly commanding officer of the RCMP in Nova Scotia. When the Mass Casualty Commission last March released its final report into the worst mass shooting in modern Canadian history, 
The RCMP said they plan to release a, quote, implementation strategy and action plan before the end of 2023. Halifax police are investigating a suspicious death in Dartmouth this morning. Police were called to a disturbance in an apartment building on Pinecrest Drive just after 7 a.m. Once inside, officers found a man who was deceased. A 47-year-old man was arrested at the scene. Police have not released any other details. They say the investigation is ongoing. The Nova Scotia government has hit pause on consolidating the town and county of Anaganish. The plan had been to pave the way for the merger, but the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, John Lohr, is halting that process to give the Utility and Review Board time to study the financial impact of bringing the two municipal units together. Many people opposed the bill at a law amendments committee earlier this month. This is simply us looking, listening. I think uh, any government, I think people the public want their government to listen, so we're willing to listen, so we're making uh, changes to res in respect to what we heard at law amendments, and as you know, we're, we're the only problems with this type of law amendments where anybody can make presentations, so we listen. Lore says the report is due by August 1st. If the UARB recommends against consolidation, Lore says it won't go ahead. If it does, Lore has named former Liberal Cabinet Minister Michel Sanson to handle the transition. After a boom of craft breweries in Nova Scotia, the taps are running dry for some. A number of recent closures have been fueled by tough economic times. And those staying in the beer business face an uncertain future. The CBC's Luke Ettinger reports. Uh, this is what they call the mash tun, which is where we add the grain. Chris Downey's mash tun is empty these days. The owner of Harbour Brewing has stopped production and plans to sell his business. For five years, he's used a single barrel system to produce craft beer in this small building in Muscadabit Harbour. And when I said I was going to put a brewery in here, some people said, oh, you can't, it's too small. And I said, oh dear, you said the C word. So challenge accepted. But that challenge wasn't easy. A global pandemic and tough tourist season due to wildfires and rainfall in 2023 meant slow business. He says it's been tiring being everything from the master brewer to head cleaner all making it harder to keep up with larger craft breweries. But um, if you're all going to grow, then your market has to grow as well. But if the market isn't growing, then the bigger guys are going to starve out the smaller guys. Downey says the NSLC marketplace was never practical for him due to the size of his operation. But being listed at the Liquor Corporation hasn't saved Brightwood Brewery from an uncertain future. This week, they announced a closure of their tap room amid a restructuring, also due to years of challenges. We really need to kind of uh, pause and, and, and refocus our efforts um, just because, you know, we've, we've had so many different revenue streams um, over, over the years. But some have closed altogether, including Serpent Brewing in Spryfield and Off Track in Bedford. Lawson says the industry could benefit from fewer tax burdens amid financially challenging times. The federal government is increasing the liquor tax by 2% on April 1st. But craft breweries across the country have received targeted support. Taxes on their first 1.5 million litres of product have been cut in half. We've been working and talking to the, uh, the province uh, and the NSLC uh, about a reduction in taxes. Uh, quite honestly, we haven't uh, gotten very far. And the fat is not over, according to the association. Craft beer sales continue to rise at NSLC. But Downey says entrepreneurs should give it some sober thought. It's not simple or cheap to start a brewery. Advice from a brewmaster with three decades of experience, who says the biggest reward is when someone compliments his craft. Luke Ettinger, CBC News, Muscadabit Harbour. And Ryan Snodden with us now from the CBC Weather Center. And a wet and windy weekend, right? Yeah, and more to come. Unfortunately, looking quite unsettled for a good chunk of this week. Uh, Tom and Amy, uh, thank you so much. A quiet start to the week, at least. Uh, today was cloudy, but at least dry. And uh, we are going to be watching, though, things turning increasingly damp over the next couple of days. 
High pressure holding on as much as it can right now. But again, the clouds are already starting to build in. That high is going to move off to the east, and that is going to allow the moisture from this system spinning off to our south and also this system coming in from the west. Uh, those are both going to be moving through the region over the next couple of days, and both will produce some of this wet weather we're tracking. Now, note the timeline here, and we will be watching overnight tonight, generally just a quiet night, couple of showers pushing their way into the South Shore region. As we move throughout the day on Tuesday, shower chances in the morning and given temperatures are going to be near the freezing mark, could see some patchy freezing rain before those temperatures do bump up on Tuesday, and they will bump up. See the darker greens here in, over the west? It's going to be our better chance of some periods of rain will be for the western half of the province for tomorrow. Cloudy, some shower chances, even a break of sun uh, possible across Cape Breton for tomorrow, uh, but increasing clouds there as well. Easterly winds 20 gusting to 40, even some gusts to 60 along that south shore. Moving forward, we're going to see more scattered showers for Yes, indeed, Tuesday night and throughout the day on Wednesday. Some fog patches starting to become in the mix with an increasingly southerly flow. Temperatures again quite mild, even some double digits as we turn the page into Wednesday and Thursday. And then watch through Thursday into Friday. Note these darker greens, even some shades of yellow here. This looks like a bit of a fire hose setting up. Uh, and that's going to be streaming into the, pro into the region. Uh, still... A little too early to nail down exactly where we'll see the heaviest rainfall, but it does look quite damp Thursday into Friday, and then eventually this will all clear out as we mix to a few flurries. Hopefully just in time for the Easter Bunny. We'll drill into that with your uh, seven-day forecast in detail coming up in a few minutes. Tom Is the Easter Bunny going to like that, I wonder? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm not yeah. sure. We shall see. Thanks so much, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Well, the warden of the municipality of Pictou County says he is reaching out to other municipalities along the Northumberland Strait to try to come up with a development plan along the coastline after the province pulled the plug on its Coastal Protection Act. So it, it puts us in a position where do we do nothing or do we uh, try and uh, do something on our own? Uh, and we're looking at possibly uh, working with some of the other municipalities that we share the Northumberland Strait with. Uh, as a possibility, but uh, it puts us in a bad place. But somebody, uh, somebody has to be willing to do the work. And for some reason, the province uh, ducked that job. I'll talk to Robert Parker about the challenges his municipality and others like it now face to protect the coastline. That's our newsmaker just after 6:30. Fishery officers have arrested dozens of people for unauthorized elver fishing in southwest Nova Scotia this month. DFO officials say they have made 39 arrests for the unauthorized harvesting of elvers since March 6th. Officers have also seized a number of vehicles, nets and weapons, along with 8.8 .8 kilograms of elvers. The fishery was closed this season after the federal government admitted it is unable to manage its illegal poaching and growing violence within the fishery. An apartment building in New Glasgow was significantly damaged by fire overnight. New Glasgow Regional Police say fire broke out at a four-unit building on Brookside Avenue just after 3 a.m. this morning. All tenants got out of the building safely and no one was seriously injured. The Canadian Red Cross is assisting those who have been displaced. The cause of the fire is under investigation. It is the talk of the town today in Sydney. Canada claimed gold at the World Women's Curling Championship at Centre 200. Just 24 hours later, organizers are already talking about what's next. Here's the CBC's Kyle Moore. It was an incredible ending to a week many curling fans won't soon forget. Rachel Homan and her Ottawa ring captured gold with a 7-5 win over Switzerland at Centre 200. Homan says that her sellout crowd was electric from the beginning to end. The fans were just, I'll never forget it. They, they were on their feet the whole game, pulling for us. Here we go, here we go, here we go! The turning point in the game came in the ninth end when Homan made a split for three, giving Canada the lead, and they never looked back. The Sunday finale ended the week-long event that attracted more than 45,000 fans. Both Curling Canada and the organizing committee were happy with the final numbers. They're happy with that. I'm happy with that. Um, you know, they dictate what the numbers are going to be based on the event. And if we surpass budget, then that's, I think, a good thing. Paul McDonald says the Women's World Curling Championship already has him wanting more and looking at what they can host next. 
to be honest with you, I'd like to host a briar here in Sydney. I think we can. I think there's still some things that need to be done with the building to allow that to happen. I don't think we're ready at, in the current state of the building uh, to do that. But hopefully over the next two or three years we get there and we can, uh, we can host an event such as the briar. Cape Breton will soon be in the national spotlight once again, with Member 2 set to host the TELUS Cup, featuring the best U18 hockey teams in the country. The puck drops for that event in April. Events are about building more visitation in our winter and shoulder seasons. You know, this is March. Uh, we've had uh, our hotel rooms filled for, for nine plus days. Terry Smith hopes visitors will spread the word about their time in Cape Breton and what it has to offer to help attract business all year round. Well, I think visitors would have experienced that trademark Cape Breton hospitality uh, and just a wonderful feeling from, from being here at this event. Um, and, and I hope that they will get just a real good taste of Cape Breton that's going to make them want to come back again. A win-win on and off the ice that has once again put Cape Breton on the map. Kyle Moore, CBC News, Sydney. All right, well, speaking of major events mm. in the province, Canada's music industry celebrated its biggest and brightest last night at the Juno Awards here in Halifax. The party saw dazzling performances, all-star tributes, and even some biting political commentary. CBC's senior entertainment reporter Eli Glasner has some of the highlights. Sometimes at the Junos, a single artist dominates, but this year in Halifax, they spread the love around with Tate McRae, with Toby, with The Beaches, and Charlotte Cardin, each taking home two Junos each. But the show opened in grand style with the return of our host, Nelly Furtado, singing a collection of her greatest hits from Man Eater to I'm Like a Bird and more. But let's go back to the beaches. They've been having a remarkable time here in Halifax. They went into the show already having won the Rock Album of the Year Award and beat out the Arkells and Nickelback to take home Group of the Year. An amazing accomplishment for this band from Toronto who had a message for their fans. To all the young girls watching, go start bands with your best friends. Thank you. The show in Halifax was the place for some powerful performances, particularly this tribute to Robbie Robertson. Get your cannonball now to take me down the line. And it was a place for some powerful statements. Tegan and Sarah were honored for their work with LGBTQ youths, and they used their time accepting the humanitarian award to call out the Alberta government with some strong words. And we are dedicated to confronting any form of discrimination that threatens the well-being of our community. <laughs> Threats like the Alberta government's attempt to prevent trans youth from accessing vital care. The show was also a reminder of the expansive variety of the Canadian music scene from Ottawa's talk, Breakthrough Artist of the Year, belting out his song on the Juno stage. To Maestro Fresh West entering the Canadian Music Hall of Fame in style and making history as the first rapper to be inducted. Next year, the party moves to Vancouver. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Halifax. Oh, yeah, we could host the big events. Yeah, I'm pretty star studded. Bring them on. <laughs> First quick break on the way. Stay with us. Yes, there's a lot more to come on CBC Nova Scotia News. The United Nations Security Council has agreed to a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in the Israel Hamas war. And Donald Trump was supposed to pay a $464 million bond today in the civil fraud judgment against him, but a New York appeals court dropped the amount significantly this afternoon. And there's a look at the Armdale roundabout, some folks heading home. Ryan is back next with his full weather forecast. We're back after this.
Yeah, some blustery weekend weather, that's for sure. Some damage, some yeah. trees down. And yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, widespread gusts, uh, 70, 80, 90 kilometers per hour. We did see some gusts uh, that exceeded 100 uh, in and around the Minas Basin. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Halifax area, we had some gusts over 100, 109 at the airport. Wow. And we also had uh, a pretty strong gust uh, at the Bedford Range, 102. So, but yeah, kind of widespread, uh, pretty significant gusts. Oh, also Escazoni, 122. Mm. Wow. And uh, in the Inverness area, of course, that was Lacewet winds, right? 142 at Plateau there. That's getting up there. So that's starting <laughs> to creep up there too. So yeah, widespread gusts, obviously those cause some outages. The winds won't be nearly as significant the next few days, but the rain is going to creep its way back in. Uh, to the forecast, uh, unfortunately. Let's have a look at our uh, webcam uh, from Nova Scotia Webcams. This is a live look, and you can see, yeah. A little gray. A little, uh, definitely <laughs> a little gray. As Lots the, of water there, though. Yeah, yeah for sure. As the Shubenacadie uh, River does flow there through South Maitland, and beautiful shot uh, nonetheless. Cloud cover or not, two degrees uh, there at uh, uh, South Maitland at last check. And you can see two in Halifax, three in Truro. And yeah, we've got those temperatures basically in the low single digits across the board. Now, as we look at the winds, those kind of telling the story as well from the northeast. So we're just really not going to see much warm air creeping in with a, a northeast wind. Easterly winds tomorrow will help to bump our temperatures up a little bit. And then eventually as we move into Wednesday and Thursday, the winds are going to become southerly and that will allow that warmer air to creep in from the south and we will see those temperatures bumping up uh, mid to late week. Gusts right now in the 30, even 40 range back towards the Yarmouth area. So there's the cloud that is again pretty dominant uh, right now all across the province. You can see the precipitation uh, being detected by the radar. Now by the time the radar beam, beam gets this far out, uh, this precipitation is, is further aloft. And by the looks of things on pretty much every forecast model, it looks like that precip will pretty much linger offshore tonight, though will creep its way into places like Shelburne, Liverpool, perhaps even Lunenburg uh, with uh, some shower chances and perhaps a little bit of patchy freezing rain, not out of the question, given the temperatures are going to be near the freezing mark. Looking at the weather systems at play, this low will work its way east. That'll kind of help to draw this moisture in as well. Uh, but this is going to be the low that really does bring that wet weather that we're going to be watching uh, Thursday, more so into the Friday time period. Looks like it'll be our wettest day of the week. Tonight, temperatures will drop anywhere between 1 and minus 2. Uh, again, right along that uh, south shore region is where we could see some of that shower activity and even some periods of freezing rain, not out of the question, tomorrow uh, into the overnight and into the early morning hours of tomorrow. Note the gusts will also be near 60 along the coast here in through the southwest. The rest of us will gust to about 40. So there's again that just possibility overnight tonight in through tomorrow morning in the southwest. The rest of us starting pretty cloudy for tomorrow morning and then we're going to be watching that rain kind of pushing into the western half of the province throughout the afternoon tomorrow. Eastern areas that dry air is going to be hanging on as much as it can. I think we will see some sunny breaks for Cape Breton tomorrow. Clouds building in. Shower chances look set to remain out of the mix until tomorrow evening. Eastern shore even. Uh, it's borderline uh, chances, yes, but it uh, looks like we will see uh, those shower chances, much like Cape Breton, hanging off till around this time tomorrow. Though I did put them in the forecast in case you have some evening plans. Uh, be mindful of that, but the day tomorrow should remain dry with even some sunny breaks in the mix. Uh, Northumberland shore cloud cover with those shower chances arriving throughout the afternoon. Four and five degrees, your temperature highs here. Better chance for showers and even periods of rain starting to push their way into the valley for tomorrow. Easterly winds gusting to 40, uh, gusting to 60 here along that south shore region for tomorrow. Once again, those periods of rain really ramping up throughout the morning. And we are looking at the Halifax area with the Easterly winds coming in off the water around three, four, five degrees uh, with those uh, periods of rain as well. Now for the Wednesday time frame, note the heaviest preset moving off. We've got shower and drizzle chances on Wednesday with the winds becoming more southerly. Fog patches are going to start to become uh, uh, into the mix throughout Wednesday as well. And then we've got this again stream of moisture that's going to be moving in from the south. Right now it looks more lined up for Thursday for New Brunswick, PEI, perhaps the valley and northern Nova Scotia and then this will wander southward and it looks like Nova Scotia, uh, the province uh, 
kind of all encompassing will get more hit uh, for Thursday night in through Friday with those periods of rain. Note the temperatures uh, staying very mild for the end of the week. Looks like this all ends from showers mixing to a few flakes as the Easter Bunny arrives Saturday night into early Sunday with perhaps a few lingering flurries for Easter Sunday and hopefully some sunshine into the afternoon. Tom and Amy. Mm. Let's hope. The <laughs> bunny hopping. can't wait to get going there, hopping around. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks so much, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. A Lego robotics program that encourages black youth to get involved in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics has a team going to California at the end of May. Nine students from the Imhotep's Legacy Academy in Halifax will compete to have the best Lego robot at the Western Edge Invitational. Take a look. This program is a, the first Lego League program. We use Legos, the youth and the participants, they use a computer software to program them to do certain commands. And they enter into competitions. Recently, we went into the Arcadia Robotics competition and we came third place. And now we have the opportunity to go to California. This program was started in 2014. And one of the mandates of Imhotep Legacy Academy is to increase the participation of children of African descent in STEM. And one of the ways we are thinking of that is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics that correlates with coding because we find that our young people are very brilliant and are curious about a bunch of stuff. And the coding program was created to further inspire them to be more curious for science and the knowledge for science. Here at Imateps, we focus on the junior division, so ages 9 to 14. Uh, every year there's a regional competition and we take them there and they focus on two things. There's an innovation project, so they come up with a project that solves a problem, a real life problem. And then on the other side, there is a mission map that they come up with every year with Lego mission models. And so they build a robot that completes these missions as much as them as possible. We found out um, just shortly after the competition that uh, we placed third, which qualifies us for the opportunity to go to international competition in the States. And uh, we'll be going to California at the end of May. There's about 15 missions, I believe. 13 to 15 missions typically. And so that robot car has an assortment of attachments that they use to complete all the missions they have. And so they have code as well stored in the robot that will complete missions in a order that they have decided. With these competitions, you don't know what you need to do. So you, you make it based on what tasks you want to complete and how you want to complete it. And like the way you build it basically helps you get the challenge is done as easy as possible or in the way that you see fit. Between now and the international competition, we're going to work towards increasing the speed and the effectiveness of the robot so that it can complete all the missions in the best way possible and get hopefully all the points. I think it's just like an, another outlet for them to just have fun, be with like-minded students and these are students of African descent so it's just another place where they can grow and uh, they can nurture their skills. I think it's important so that at an early age they know that they're capable because they have other university students who are African Nova Scotian or African people of African descent teaching them they see that okay this is something that I can pursue in university because if someone in university that looks like me is teaching me the coding program, that can inspire them to pursue that as a career path. So what we try to do is to just spark that interest and show them that this is a possibility for you for the future. Robot engineers, robotic engineers of the future yeah, for sure. Yeah, they're having fun too. Sure are. Up next, I'll talk with the warden of the municipality of Pictou County about the pressure some municipalities are now feeling to protect the coast. That's our Newsmaker interview. Please stay with us. You're watching CBC Nova Scotia News.
The North Shore of Nova Scotia suffered some of the worst damage from Hurricane Fiona. Now, the Houston government has backed away from its own Coastal Protection Act. Municipalities like the one in Pictou County are feeling pressure to do something to protect their coastline. Robert Parker is the warden of the municipality of Pictou County. Sir, I know municipalities like yours trying to come to terms with the Houston government's recent decision to not proceed with the Coastal Protection Act. How do you feel about that decision? Oh, not good, I guess, would be putting it nicely. Uh, disappointed, maybe, and a whole lot of other words. Uh, our council was uh, kind of holding back. Uh, we discussed this several times, whether we should go ahead or or is the province going to do something? And they kept promising us, uh, particularly from the Minister of Environment, uh, but also from the Minister of Municipal Affairs, that something was going to happen. We just need a few more consultations. And... Uh, it seemed like they were kind of putting it off, and uh, in the end, I guess that's what it was. And uh, I think it's a terrible uh, decision and a decision that's disrespectful of municipalities. A lot of people feel like it's a download on, on the municipalities. I'm wondering, practically speaking, from where you sit, where does this leave your municipality when it comes to protecting the coastline there? Well, it leaves us sort of as the last stop now. There's a, you know, for some reason, and nobody's given us a good reason, the province decided to uh, withdraw from this, uh, supposedly based on these consultations, but we haven't seen anything that really proves that. So it, it puts us in a position where do we do nothing or do we uh, try and uh, do something on our own? Uh, and we're looking at possibly uh, working with some of the other municipalities that we share the North Humberland Street with uh, as a possibility. But uh, it puts us in a bad place, but somebody, uh, somebody has to be willing to do the work, and for some reason the province uh, ducked that job. The province does say that it made or is making uh, things available like flood mapping and, and other uh, tools to uh, help individuals and communities decide what is best for their properties. What do you make of that approach? Oh, I, d I don't have a lot of use for that approach. It really says it's too hot a potato for us to handle. So here, you fellas handle it. You take the heat. Uh, for Somebody has to take the heat for doing the right thing. And uh, I, I really think, uh, as I mentioned before, it's... Uh, similar to saying, uh, look, we don't want you to speed on our highways and here's, uh, here's some books to tell you why not. And then you decide what to do. Everybody can make their own decision. It, it, you can make all kinds of comparisons the same way, but people will make decisions in their own best interest uh, because they own the property. But if there's no general rules uh, to uh, go by, well, you can do whatever you please. After you read all the books or, or throw all the books away or whatever, you can do what you please. So, it's going to be up to municipalities. I guess the way I look at it is each individual owns the lot that they're on. They, they purchase it, they pay the price for it, and they own a, a deed to that. But we also, we all own the coast of Nova Scotia. Uh, you know, it belongs to us, uh, the people of Nova Scotia. And I'm afraid what's going to happen if we continue down this road, uh, we're going to, the, it's not going to belong to Nova Scotians. It's going to belong to those who have enough money in their pocket to pay for the protection of that coast. And uh, that's the road we're traveling on, and uh, the decision by the mm -hmm. French government only leads us further down that road. We need to protect our coast for all our citizens, and it's going to be the job of the municipalities now to do that. And now you say you'd like to work with some of the other municipalities in that part of the province. Why do you feel it's best if numerous municipalities get together and work on this? Well, just for, the, if nothing else, for the uh, understanding and the simplicity of how it works. If you uh, live in Pictou County and you're going under certain rules, we you know, say we come up with a strategy and a bylaw, but then you go down a little bit and, oh, I slipped into Antigonish County, they got a different uh, set of rules and bylaws. And, you know, we have that common coast. There's a lot of commonality. When uh, Fiona hit us, and it hit us hard, uh, in Pictou, Antigonish, Cumberland, Colchester, right down into Cape Breton. Uh, you know, there's a commonality to that. Uh, and so we've got a similar type of rock makeup, a uh, similar type of uh, sand and shore. Uh, so there's a, if we have a common bylaw that uh, people know, no matter where they are along the Northumberland Strait, 
that there's a, the rules don't change if you move up and down the shore. It just, uh, to me, it seems, and it's been recommended by some of my councillors, let's reach out to the other municipalities along the Northumberland Strait and uh, see if there's any interest in, in working together. Yeah, we'll see what shape or form this does take. Robert Parker, warden of the municipality of Pictou County, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Coming up, after weeks of turmoil, Boeing's CEO announced today he is stepping down at the end of the year. The United Nations Security Council has passed a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war. The U.S. abstained from today's vote, which angered Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Journalist Sally Patterson has more. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres spent his weekend at the Gaza border, renewing his calls for a ceasefire there, as more than a million people face starvation in the Strip. And now the UN Security Council has passed a resolution echoing those calls, after several previous attempts to do so over the past five months have failed. On Monday, the Council rejected an amendment proposed by Russia that would have called for a permanent ceasefire, but it backed the 
draft as a whole, calling for an immediate one. Speaking after the vote, China made a point of reminding Security Council members that resolutions are binding and the council could use enforcement measures if parties don't abide by them. But in her statement, the United States representative at the UN, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, called this a non-binding resolution, leading to questions over what impact Monday's vote will really have. The US, UK and Israel all condemned the fact that the text doesn't explicitly condemn Hamas's attacks on Israel on October 7th, which left 1,200 people dead and more than 200 taken hostage. The US, though, didn't use its veto vote to stop the text in its tracks, which went down badly with Israel. In response, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu cancelled a visit by his senior advisers to the White House that was due to take place later this week. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby says US officials had been looking forward to speaking to them about alternatives to a planned ground offensive in Rafa, which the US doesn't support. Israel maintains Rafah is Hamas's last major stronghold in the Gaza Strip and says it will go ahead with or without Washington's support. Sally Patterson for CBC News, New York. A three-story building has been heavily damaged in the latest Russian airstrike against Ukraine. The building in central Kyiv was hit by a missile this morning. President of Ukraine Volodymyr Zelensky says that it was a school and that five people were hurt in the daylight attack. The missile strike also blew out the front window of a nearby cafe. The barista dove under a counter to take cover and suffered minor injuries. Two other missiles were reportedly intercepted, scattering, de scattering debris across three neighborhoods. A total of 10 people are said to have been hurt. Donald Trump was due to pay $464 million bond today in the civil fraud judgment against him, but a New York appeals court has lowered the amount significantly to $175 million. And the former U.S. president has been given 10 more days to get the money. Most either $175 million in cash or bonds or security or whatever is necessary uh, very quickly within the 10 days. But Judge Angoran is a disgrace to this country. If he meets the new deadline, the state will not seize his assets while he appeals the judgment. A judge found Trump and his co-defendants fraudulently, fraudulently inflated the value of his assets. Meanwhile, a New York judge has set April the 15th as the trial date for Trump's hush money case. He's charged with falsifying business records to hide payments made to an adult film star to cover up an alleged affair. There has been a major shakeup at Boeing. CEO Dave Calhoun will step down at the end of this year. As Scott Peterson tells us, this follows weeks of turmoil after a door blew off a Boeing plane. There's no secret here that, uh, that Boeing was having trouble with their 737 MAX jets. There was ongoing safety problems, quality control issues. It's also no secret that Boeing 737 MAX is their flagship brand, their best-selling airplane. So those two factors there, something was bound to give. And this is what we're seeing as far as the CEO now this morning stepping down. Dave Calhoun uh, is leaving at the end of the year. And so for a large company like Boeing, they have to uh, transmit this information to the shareholders, to the public a large time in advance. Now, he's a longtime Boeing director. He started as a CEO in 2020. That was following the return of the 737 MAX to commercial service in wake of those two deadly and fatal accidents and a lengthy global grounding. Now, in a letter to employees today, that door that blew off in midair was, in his words, quote, a watershed moment for Boeing, that the eyes of the world are on us and we will come through this moment, a better company building on the learnings that we've accumulated. Now, also stepping down as part of this shape up is the head of the commercial aircraft division and the head of the board will not be seeking re-election. So this is a somewhat of a large shakeup for the company as well. And this is, follows a sweeping audit by the FAA just last week identifying say that there was poor quality control issues going on and the safety culture at Boeing needed to be ramped up. And so clearly Boeing responded by saying Mr. Calhoun and under his management as CEO was not acting fast enough. And usually when you have something like this, I mean, 
traditionally shareholders don't like uncertainty, but in this instance here, the shares were up this morning. They opened up about 3% trading, which is a vote of confidence saying that this move by Boeing might just get to these quality controls issues. So there's some optimism there, but Boeing shares so far to this year down 27%, but some optimism that maybe we'll start seeing some more uh, substantial changes with the management at Boeing. Scott Peterson, CBC News, Toronto. As we head towards the Easter holiday, a traditional treat is getting a lot more expensive. The price of chocolate is rising because of a global shortage of its key ingredient, cocoa. Bad weather and plant disease have reduced cocoa production, mainly in West Africa. Ivory Coast, which grows about 40% of the world's cocoa, has seen its production fall by nearly a third. The cost of cocoa has more than doubled in the last year, hitting a record high that topped $12,000 per metric ton today. Another key ingredient in chocolate, sugar, has seen significant price increases over the last three years. Vancouver's famed Stanley Park is getting a renovation of sorts. Large numbers of trees are being cut down in response to a moth infestation. But there is controversy around the project. The CBC's Yvette Brend reports. <laughs> This tree, rooted not long after Stanley Park was created over a century ago, its life cut short by a devastating infestation. It's sad. It's very sad. I've been coming to this park since I was a little girl, and I've never seen anything like this before. An estimated 160,000 trees are being cut in the park. Most are younger western hemlocks. Their needles were eaten away by looper moth caterpillars. The first priority is public safety. Vancouver's Park Board says weakened trees could fall, even spark fires if they hit power lines. It's been a race over the past few months to get the work done before birds nest. We are the busiest urban park in Canada, the second biggest in North America. 18 million visits a year, you cannot simply have towering uh, logs uh, ready to fall on people in busy, crowded places. The 400-hectare park is home to half a million trees, some centuries old, winding through the urban forest and network of trails, some now transformed. But many park goers aren't happy about it. This park is the jewel of Vancouver. People love this Thousands park. are petitioning to stop the cutting. Obviously, when we see forests being cut down in our neighbourhood, we have an emotional reaction. But we've gone beyond that and looked at the actual science. She says this much cutting is overkill, but experts say the city has made the right move. The city, I, I believe, you know, did the right thing in, uh, you know, sort of looking after the safety of people uh, by removing, uh, you know, the dead trees. Next week, replanting of 25,000 seedlings begins. Hopefully my grandkids and, and their kids will be able to enjoy what I've been able to enjoy. It will take a while for locals to feel at home here again. Yvette Brand, CBC News, Vancouver. Energy and mining stocks got a boost from rising commodity prices today, but Canada's main stock index closed down overall to kick off a short trading week. Here's a look at how the markets did as we head to break.
For news you can trust, we have the latest on what's happening in your community and a weather forecast you can rely on no matter where you are in Atlantic Canada. I'm Amy Smith. And I'm Ryan Snodden. Join us for Atlantic tonight. Right after the National. Well, it's going to be mild at least. Mm -hmm. uh, latter part of the week and oh, boy, the wet. weekend was it was yeah. howling wasn't it? it for parts of it there, yeah. were, there were some decent parts yeah, so. sure. Saturday night Sunday morning yeah, for yeah. sure was uh, was pretty uh, yeah pretty windy for sure and I guess Cape Breton you folks uh, into the wind mm. a little longer into the perhaps uh, afternoon hours there but uh, yeah the wind won't be as much of an issue this week that's for sure definitely not compared to uh, for, for Saturday night Sunday but uh, the rain is going to creep back into the forecast the good news is that we we have last night's sunset because there's about <laughs> that was very 25 there pictures that. of yeah. last yeah. night's sunset. It was brilliant. We're yes. going to ride that all week with the viewer <laughs> picture of the it. day uh, because the skies are going to be pretty gray. So I'm not sure we'll see a ton of viewer pictures this week. So the good news is uh, we'll go back to this oh, well nice. again and again and again. Look at this beautiful shot. Paul Morris from St. Mary's Bay last night. And yeah, there's more to come this week. Trust me, mm -hmm. a lot of great sunset picks uh, coming. Uh, there's the stream of moisture coming in. So it's clouds tonight, a few showers in through the southwest. Uh, those rains moving into the western half of the province tomorrow, showers in the east. And then we'll be watching uh, those uh, showers to continue into Tuesday night and Wednesday. Temperatures anywhere from four to five, six, seven degrees. Uh, looks like the mildest temps will be indeed in the valley tomorrow down towards Yarmouth County. Wednesday, milder temperatures building back in 5 to 7 degrees across Cape Breton, 8 to 12, even 13 degrees in through the Annapolis Valley on Wednesday. So it will be turning mild. It's all about the winds. Note the arrows going from east to west here. So an easterly wind Tuesday night. And then note that the winds will shift on Wednesday. Yes, showers, drizzle. But those southerly winds will bump our temperatures up, staying mild for late week, but uh, certainly damp uh, later Thursday, particularly Friday into the early weekend. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that, Ryan. Well, finally tonight, how's this for some speedy restaurant service? <laughs> Harris revived its historic cafe waiters race this past weekend after a 13-year break. The servers had to carry a typical French breakfast of one croissant, a glass of water and a cup of coffee. Now the rules call for no running and no spilling. About 200 people competed. <laughs> the winner received a free restaurant outings and a ticket to the Paris Olympics opening ceremony. The race has been held since 1914, was uh, put on hold after 2011 because of a lack of sponsorship. Nice to see they served up a great <laughs> comeback. Yeah, yeah I did. breakfast has been served. I would That's... not make that finish line. I don't no. think so, huh? Me too. That's it for us tonight. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Good night. Good night.